Hello there, I'm Gloria Bakarenko. Well, here we are moving forward and continuing to make smart choices during this pandemic. This is Our Vancouver. Coming up, lessons about love and language while shopping for our elderly parents. And a Kelowna teen uses her home time to create a cookbook for kids. But first, legendary artist Robert Davidson talks about the award-winning documentary about his life and work. You're watching an excerpt of Haida Modern. The documentary about the life and work of artist Robert Davidson is going to be aired on Knowledge Network June 2nd, and it'll be streamed online too. Now, the film has won numerous awards already, and its message is pretty timely considering the COVID-19 pandemic. Robert Davidson is connecting to us today from his home. Robert, hello. What a pleasure to speak with you today. Hi, Gloria. Glad to be here. So it's interesting that this film was made well before the pandemic hit, but how would you say it, it speaks to our need to, you know, slow down, remember to respect nature? Yeah, actually that thought has been in my mind for a long time. Um, uh, some of the paintings I've done, for example, uh, I did a painting, I think um, around the late, 80s, 1980s, uh, called Hugging the World. And another one, re most recent, is uh, What Will Be Left for Our Grandchildren. I have five grandchildren, and I'm very um, concerned what will be left for them. And I, I, I feel the more people on board to answer that question, I think we need a large team to answer that question. Well, how have you been doing during the pandemic? Have you been, been able to be in contact with your grandkids? Actually, just in the last two weeks, I've been uh, uh, with the um, in, encouragement of my son, uh, Zoomy. So I'm, I'm discovering the, the new app that people have been using for a while. And so we actually had one session this morning, one visit this morning. And I've been talking about my own journey from right from the beginning. Um, and so it's been really good to share that st my story with them. Oh, that is lovely. And I know that just this uh, downtime has provided us with a lot of opportunities. So you're saying you took it back to the beginning. Why don't you take us back to the beginning? What, what got you interested in art and making art in the first place? It was actually my dad, my, dad, my father, who started me off. Um, I remember um, like he was continually pushing myself, my brother Rich, and my sister to be self-sufficient. And with his encouragement, he, he got on me when I was about 13 to um, start carving in argillite because he was, uh, I think, about two years Prior to that, he was carving, and my grandfather was doing the same. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so, um, being at that age where I just wanted to play with my friends, it, it, it was. Well, once I started to st carve and and work with my dad and my grandfather, I really enjoyed it. It it almost felt like a deja vu. It felt like I've been there before. Oh, that's, a, that's lovely. No, I just, I'm thinking about all the beautiful things you have created over the years, Robert, the, the jewelry, the sculptures, the drums. What would you say inspires you in that artistic process? I, I, I like to think of the artist's role as filling the void. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, when I, when I hear stories uh, of, of things that are, for example, when there's, it seems like there's a gap somewhere, so I, I like to um, come up with an idea. For example, last, uh, I think three years ago, my wife and I hosted a potlatch in Massif, and that was to um, give a dance screen to each clan, surviving clan. And the idea there was so that when the clan hosted an event, 
the dance screen would would identify who they are with one of their crests. And uh, last year, uh, we hosted a potlatch in Heidelberg, my hometown. And, and that's what I mean by filling the void. It, it's events, it, it's situations like that that inspire me. And also looking at how how we treat nature. Like, like I don't, I don't think there's much respect there. So I feel we need to, this pandemic is really nature pushing the pause button. And, and what, an, what a brilliant idea. I hate to say it like that. Well, I think about this documentary and uh, it really is a celebration of you and, and your work has a lot of high profile people talking about just how much your work has influenced them and, and made them think, made them appreciate your views. How does it feel to be on the other end of all of that praise and hear all these people telling you how wonderful you've been? <laughs> well, it's uh, certainly a far, far reach from when I first started. I remember when I came to Vancouver, uh, there were only four places where I could sell my my Ardrolite carvings and, and we were labeled curios then. And it took a few years, a few decades before we were recognized as an art form. And and I'm very excited that 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 process actually started uh, I think the major show was at the Vancouver Art Gallery uh, their exhibition called Art of the Raven. Arts of the Raven, and that showcased all the the uh, the old masters of Northwest Coast art in one place, and 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 things started to continually expand from there. And so when I <coughs> excuse me when I when I was learning, I was actually learning from the old masters, and the old masters they laid the foundation. And so, and I like to think of the art form like the alphabet. And so once I learned the alphabet, then I was able to um, expand on it, expand my understanding of the art form. Robert Davidson, A to Z. Okay. Uh, so what have you been working on these days as you're close to home? I'm working on a tonopole right now. It's a commission through the Doug Reynolds Gallery. It's a 22 foot totem pole and the, the log is quite large. It's, it's five feet at the butt, at the base, and it's, the client is from Romania. And the title of the totem pole is Beyond Being Silenced. It's a, <clears throat> it's a uh, variation of another totem pole I did about 15 years ago called We Were Once Silenced. And, and this, the client said, do, do what you always wanted to do. And I was excited about the, about his parameters, which was wide open. Well, I'm glad you've been busy. I look forward to seeing the documentary. Robert, uh, such a pleasure. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much too. Good to me. Good to talk with you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Barb and Mike from New York and you're watching our Vancouver. Well, it's time for one of our favorite features when we get to showcase a number of the photographs sent in by you, our audience. And this week we feature images from the walks people have been taking. First, Nikki Byers was out on the Richmond Dyke and saw this wonderful patch of flowers in full bloom. A stunning burst of color there. Thank you so much, Nikki. And Parvi Parekh was out for a stroll in Coal Harbor and was struck by the beauty of the boats on the water. Nice work there, thank you. And finally, Deborah Russell found the fun in a field outside Abbotsford. That's a creative hay bale cover and a happy message. Thanks so much for sharing that, Deborah. And do send us more. It's easy. You just email them to bcphotos at cbc.ca. That's all one word, bcphotos at cbc.ca. 
Now, Tina Ma has done what a lot of adult children do these days. She has taken over grocery shopping for her elderly parents due to COVID-19 restrictions. But in her case, the challenge of shopping at the Chinese grocer has required some language lessons. And it's brought her closer to what she calls her lotus roots. Just take a look. I'm here to do shopping for my mom and dad. Because of COVID-19, they haven't been able to do their grocery shopping. So I'm here to go to the Chinese butcher, the pharmacist, pick up some groceries for them. I've got my gloves on, I've got my mask, I've got my cash, and we're ready to go in. Molly, I've been here. This one? Here at the Richmond Public Market. Um, uh, the reason why I've come to like coming here, it feels like I'm really immersed. Um, in the Chinese language when I come here because it's a predominantly Chinese market. So I just uh, finished my stop at the Chinese Herbalist and I was able to use my Chinese and ask for gao ge, which is dried goji berries. My mom uses these in Chinese broths and um, I got to practice my Chinese and learn a new word and uh, I feel proud of myself for doing that. So this is my uh, second or third stop of the day and I'm at Price Smart. I'm here to get some fish, fresh fish for my mom and dad. Hello, mom. Hello. Hi, Sonia. This was my shopping haul for today and uh, typically this is probably about how much I would buy in one trip and I've been doing this for about eight weeks. Um, every time I go I learn something new or I practice my Chinese in a different way. So I'm really proud of my purchase of lotus root today. My mom, I think, will really like this one because she always says, avoid the ones that have black parts. And uh, there's meat products in there. There's a little bit of bitter melon. I like being able to get them a few treats as well because it's hard being at home and I feel like uh, this can bring a bit of happiness to them. So over the last eight weeks uh, during uh, COVID-19 restrictions, um, I've learned a lot about my mom and dad and my culture as well. I have challenged myself to speak more Chinese when I'm outside of the home with different shopkeepers. Finally, um, I've just learned how to choose good fresh food myself. So um, I know how to pick a good lotus root now. I know what a good price is for lobak. And um, I think that I've been able to share in something that my parents care deeply for and just continue to appreciate each other and just acknowledge that food brings us together. Coming up, planting new skills and the promise of affordable food for those in need during the pandemic. Hi, you're watching Our Vancouver. I'm Gloria Makarenko. Now, COVID-19 has hit some families really hard. Unemployment is high, and some people are worried about what they're going to eat and how to pay for it. So that's why a Victoria group is putting together planters for those in need. We are the Food Eco District. Uh, we're a local nonprofit trying to create the first sustainable dining district in the country. And we're organizing an emergency response to COVID-19 by providing free startup food garden kits for those really struggling through this time. So we kind of recognized that we needed a way to provide these for people so that they could start on their own. For those who didn't have access to uh, gardening materials, we would be able to give them a bit of a leg up, creating a more 
food secure region. So it's lots of people who lost their job, who are immunocompromised, who are scared to get to the grocery store, uh, seniors who don't want to leave their homes, um, and people who are just really struggling with depression or mental health issues mainly. The recipients get to choose between two to five of our round planters that you can see behind us. Uh, they also get the soil for those planters. They get four to five starter plants to get them going. And then we'll also provide up to 70 seeds of different varieties so that they can learn how to grow and start themselves. So we grow everything in geotextile, um, these geotextile fabric containers, which are semi-permeable, so they're really good for allowing the roots to breathe. And also for um, water retention, they only hold on to as much as uh, the soil really needs. And then of course they're black, so they, they attract heat as well. People are loving chard and kale right now. Arugula, lettuce, and mizuna, um, kind of those nice uh, flavorful greens are always in demand, we find. Now cooking has been a go-to activity for so many people during the early phase of COVID-19. And more young people stuck in the house have found their way to the kitchen too. Well, Abigail Langford is a Kelowna teen who turned her passion into a cookbook project. Abigail, hello there. Hi. So first, let's talk about you in the kitchen. What kinds of things do you like to cook? Um, I love cooking. Pesto is my favorite food. Um, so I would say I love doing that and I love baking. Um, Okay, has that been always, or have you found you've gone, gravitated to different things during the, the lockdown with COVID-19? Um, <laughs> well, I think I have been eating a little bit more since the lockdown, but um, I, I have been gravitating towards like, I don't know, salty things for some reason. I don't know if that's weird or not, but Salty yeah. things <laughs> like, like what? What kinds of recipes have you tried? Um, I really like kale chips. Um, and I, of course I just, I like chips. I like, um, I like eggs, like salty eggs. Um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I've even taken to putting a little bit of salt on my chocolate chip cookies just when I bake them, oh. you know, a little gross, a little chunky salt on there and just get that little bit of a, a mix with the, with the chocolate as well. I want to yeah. hear about your cookbook <laughs> now. So how did this whole idea for a cookbook come about? Um, well, we all, um, me and my four co-authors, co we met at a master, like a mastermind group where our families met up. And so we hung out and we started cooking for the adults and we made them lots of things involving coffee because our reasoning was, um, what's one thing that parents love? Coffee. Um, and so we made them lots of that. And one of the um, parents, she came to us and she said, why don't you guys make a cookbook? We all laughed it off. And then, um, we got a deal. <laughs> That's great. Well, let me tell me about some of the coffee dishes that you created or desserts. <laughs> we made um, coffee chocolate pancakes um, and then just coffee chocolate. And then I think we made like coffee covered something. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But it stuck. It hit a chord, obviously, with the adults. So, I mean, there are a lot of cookbooks out there right now. Uh, what do you think sets your cookbook apart? Um, this cookbook is, first of all, 100% written by kids, which in and of itself is, is just an incredible thing, like nothing else out there is like that. But also it's incredibly allergy friendly. Um, out of the 100 recipes, 80 of them are allergy friendly, gluten free. And um, we also have a substituting for allergies recipe at the beginning of the book. And then besides that, we have like a meal planning chapter and a chapter on how to properly and safely use knives, but not just like simple things like paring knives, but bigger like chef knives. And um, I guess the entire, the idea of the book is that it's not, um, we're showing that kids can do more than people think they can. <laughs> so what kinds of things were you learning along the way as you put together this book? I learned so much. I think the thing that I learned the most was communication or just like to properly communicate with people um, and um, not to uh, promise things that I'm not going to deliver on. I, I also learned a lot of stuff in the kitchen, just like um, I learned knife techniques. I learned um, not to deep fry things <laughs> um, and some, some other really helpful tips. So overall, it was a great experience. So how do you hope that this book is ultimately going to be used? I hope 
kids around the world can use this book to um, not necessarily like just pursue um, careers or something, but but really learn how to um, love the kitchen and not hate and not like be scared of it, not be afraid of what's behind the cabinets, really understand it and be familiar with it. And um, I'm hoping that it also encourages people that um, that that healthy eating is not just just like kale or just, you know, eating greens or something like it can be really delicious. And creative. Well, you're inspiring, Abigail. Thanks very much for telling us about your project. Yeah, thank you for having me. Bonjour, je m'appelle Nathalie. Vous regardez notre Vancouver. Live concerts and entertainment events have been cancelled during COVID-19, but there are many virtual ways you can experience art and culture in our city. Graduates of VCC's jewelry program usually host an exhibit and sale at this time of year. Well, that has now moved to a window shopping model at the Craft Council of BC's Granville Island location. You can also see the work on Facebook on the VCC Jewelry Art and Design page. And the NFB has put so much more of their collection online, including Vancouver director Christina Willing's short film, Beauty Beyond Binary. It follows the lives of five gender creative kids and what it means for them to be truly human. Just go to the NFB webpage to see that and so much more. Hey, I'm Grant Lawrence from CBC Music coming to you from home. So over the past few weeks, I've shared with you some of the best of Quarantunes, songs and videos that professional Canadian musicians are making from home. But what about music students? Kids that abruptly had their choirs and music classes canceled. What is a music class to do in the age of COVID-19? Well, check it out. That is Enter A Cappella, a contemporary choir from Sir William Murlock Secondary from Newmarket, Ontario, performing a beautiful version of the Jimmy Webb song, That's All I've Got to Say. And that's a school that has done very well in our Canadian Music Class Challenge, CBC's yearly fall initiative where we ask music classes to learn a Canadian song and send us the video. Here's another of last year's participants keeping their lessons alive in the COVID era. Made up of young musicians from Nanaimo and central Vancouver Island, that is Fidelium, a group that is part of the Cross Canada Fiddle Program. Last year, they won first place in the Canadian Music Class Challenge, and now they are continuing to keep their students connected by learning from home. Now here's a school from Montreal that recently did a special re-edit of their Canadian Music Class Challenge entry from last year. They're dedicating this version of the Arkells song People's Champ to the frontline workers. Thank you for everything that you're doing for us. It's really appreciated. Thank you, all the essential workers. Ça va bien aller, et on continue toute la gang. Thank you. 
What can you say? That's beautiful. Those are the kids from Honoré Mercier Elementary from Montreal coming together from their homes to pay tribute to Quebec's frontline workers through their version of the Arkell song, People's Champ. Because as their teacher, George Anthropolis wrote to me, it's the frontline workers who are the true people's champs. And yes, the Canadian Music Class Challenge will be returning for another year. Watch for our song list in June and for the contest to start up again in September. For more information on the Canadian Music Class Challenge, go to cbc.ca slash music class. I'm Grant Lawrence. Keep Canadian music alive. Keep music education flowing. And I'll check in with you again next week. Coming up, meet the mother trees feeding surrounding saplings in our BC forests. Hi, welcome back to Our Vancouver. I'm Gloria Makarenko. Now, many of you may be spending more time in the forest these days. The trees really speak to those who seek nature. And it turns out those trees are also communicating with each other, with a mother tree in charge. UBC has been researching this phenomenon. Here's some fungal networks right here. Look at that. Wow. That's the big internet. So I started looking at below ground ecosystems and discovered that there's this internet of mycorrhizal fungi, which are fungi that are mutually beneficial to the trees and the fungi, and they actually can connect the trees together and serve as highways for movement of information and resources and water from tree to tree. We went on to map what this fungal highway or network looked like underground. And we found that the most highly connected trees were the biggest, oldest trees. We even went on to find out that they can recognize which seedlings are their own, their, their kin. So this led us to start calling them mother trees because of all the things that they do in the forest. And the idea of that is try to project using this experiment um, how retention of old trees will become more important as climate stresses our forests. And we're actually finding in our early results that um, in the seedlings that we've planted under the forest, that the more old trees that we retain in harsher climates, the better off the seedlings are doing. So this is an example of a clear cut. This is actually one of our experimental clear cuts. It's about five hectares in size. So it's, it's a small one compared to what's done in operations. Um, but this is typical. You know, as carbon gets stored in the soil from the tree into the fungi and the bacteria and they decompose the forest floor, that carbon eventually moves deeper and deeper into the, into the soil. Those are the carbon pools that are the most stable sinks for, for CO2. So it's really crucial in forestry that we learn how to protect that. If all that carbon in the soil also went into the atmosphere, climate change would speed up really, really fast. And so forest practices really need to strive to protect that. And what we think is that partial re retaining these mother trees, partial retention of the trees on the forest actually helps keep it in there. You know, the engineers, for example, are trying to figure out ways how to, how to capture carbon and store it below ground using all this fancy technology. But here, these trees, they do it, right? They've evolved for millions of years to, to do this through photosynthesis. It's the most ingenious, you know, highly specialized me mechanism already. There's a recognition that clear cutting isn't, you know, the best thing everywhere. Foresters know this. So we have many industrial partners who are looking at alternatives. They want to know how to do a better job. You know, as climate change is really affecting more and more people and we're recognizing that we've got to do something now, um, that I think that this is going to be adopted at a much faster rate in, in the very near future. We're coming, it's coming, the time is now and people are ready for it. 2020 was supposed to be a big year for Tanya Yaganaba. 
After 12 years performing in Vancouver, the soul and R&B singer had finally been booked for the Vancouver Jazz Fest. But you know the rest. In the middle of March, everything changed. Tanya did connect with Stephen Quinn on the early edition and played a wonderful song. It's good morning to you. Good morning to you. How are you today? I'm very well. How are you holding up? I'm holding up just great. I'm one of the blessed lucky ones that was able to access CERB. And uh, as much as some people think it's a trip to think about that, as a as a gigging musician, having $2,000 of guaranteed income a month is kind of like a raise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that's kind of sad when you think about it. It's really sad. But this is an opportunity to look at all of the ways that our system is sad and um, think of new ways to approach them. And what has life been like for you over the past few months? Um, well... I have um, a disease called MS, which is um, a neuro, neurological disease that is degenerative mm -hmm. in nature. And so there's been a lot of, um, obviously COVID-19 has been really stressful, but for folks that have underlying conditions or that have um, other illnesses that they're dealing with, um, it's an, a time of hyper, hyper vigilance. So um, yeah, I've just been I don't. I really hesitate to use the word lockdown because that's not what we're living through. But I myself have been under pretty extreme, uh, you know. Um, I would say more than social distancing, just really keeping away from from um, folks in an effort to try and keep myself safe and also keep them safe. It's interesting because I, I know a few people who are immunocompromised, and you know you can't tell obviously by looking at them, but you know, they're just staying home through all of this. They're not going anywhere because they're so vulnerable. Yeah, I can't remember the last time I went to a grocery store or went to visit anything other than the <laughs> corner store. That's my one. Once a week, I go to the corner store. <laughs> uh, and, and do you have somebody helping you out then? I am very lucky to be in a beautiful relationship with uh, my husband who lives with me. And that's mm -hmm. one of the things that's been a trip is that he's still working. So that's part of why um, I've had to be extra, extra, extra careful because he has to go out into the world every day. Yeah, well, um, and, and has to be careful to make sure not to bring anything home. Oh, I make sure about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, you go a little set up by the door. I'm like, don't bring any of your crap inside. <laughs> <laughs> Just drop your clothes there and hose down. Exactly. Um, we know what this year has been like for artists and for musicians. I mean, there you were scheduled to play the Vancouver Jazz Festival. Um, what did that performance mean to you? Um, everything. I mean, as a musician that's lived here, I'm not from here, but I've lived here for the last 12 years. And once, mm -hmm. it, you know, they always say as an artist, like your hometown is the last place to like big you up or put you on. <laughs> So I've been waiting so long for this Jazz Fest show. And uh, a couple of years ago, I played Montreal Jazz Fest. And I was like, okay, so Montreal says yes, and Vancouver says no. So for me, this was just like sweet, 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 uh, not vindication, but you know what I mean. Yeah. And um, for it to, um, but I realized that like, I mean, who cares? The music industry is nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> but you also had, you were lined up to play the Burnaby Roots and Blues Festival as well. I can't even. The oh, amount no, of, I know. Yeah. The amount of things that aren't happening anymore is um, wild, but I see it as an opportunity, honestly. I am really passionate about lots of things, not just music. And this has given me such a gift of time. Whenever does the universe say, shut up and read books? <laughs> Whenever Not often need, enough. Yeah, the universe never says, hey, if you don't want to be on social media, now is a good time to just take a step back from that. Like we are being given so much opportunity and permission to step into our real selves in this moment. And I'm choosing to utilize that. Well, you are going to play a song for our live radio audience this morning. I so am. lots of people listening who will appreciate it. Hopefully they um, like it. <laughs> Slowly, slowly, slowly hold your breath Release the mechanisms that pretend We 
you smile, hot from breaking, and you be hard from shaking. This fear must stay. Said, oh, 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 the strength in your weakness will to overcome. Be it too big to fail, and the worst is yet to come. To wrestle your demons, when you slave to your guilt. This just for next season. I swear the best is yet to come. Maybe the worst is yet to come. I swear the best is yet to come. Tanya Ganaba, thank you so much. Your guitar sounds so amazing. What are you thank playing? You. I am playing a rip-off Epiphone, S Epiphone SG. Thank you, Tom mm -hmm. Lee. Remember when we used to go to Tom Lee Music? Oh, yeah, back in the before time. <laughs> back in the before time. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> Hi, my name is Elena. My name is Vakesh. And, and this, this is, is our Vancouver. Vancouver. Coming up, a segment we are calling Remember When. are watching Our Vancouver. I'm Gloria Makarenko. Now, the COVID-19 pandemic has cut car traffic greatly. So we've seen animals and birds take back spaces in the absence of people. And the question is, will people and politicians use this as a way to, you know, refocus on the environment? Well, while we wonder about that, here's a story from 1992 and a group of environmentalist teenagers on Galliano Island. Eve Savory reintroduces us to them. That, say these children, is the sound of rain falling softly in the rainforest, a forest that is threatened. Poverty and the destruction of the forests in South America are very closely connected. They are 12 to 13 years old and they are raising money to go to the United Nations Conference on Environment and Development, UNSAID, in Rio de Janeiro next month. We want to act as the conscience of decision makers and remind them who they're making the decision for. They call themselves ECO, the Environmental Children's Organization. They need $21,000 to take themselves idea, and a chaperone. You know. Money is our one problem, but we are determined to go to bring a message of our own. Have you been they've had book sales and bake sales, and they've done phenomenally well. Tonight, with the help of an enthusiastic audience, ECO raised $4,600. How much have you just, how much have you just Six hundred and this is and five eleven hundred. All they need is another four thousand. And Rafi will pay the money we don't raise. That's they've published a newsletter for the last two years. They've raised money for the rainforest, but Rio is their biggest project ever. So the next thing is visas, and I'll give um, each of you one of these. Well, I've got one, but I filled I it out. But I don't know where to send it and everything. Okay. No, if all goes as planned, they will get um, to make I'm a very brief speech. Yeah. Four minutes each, or? No, four, no, four minutes. minutes for the whole thing. Oh, Isn't that short? Gross. So what we have to work on this weekend is making mm. our message really concise and clear. So They are convinced mm -hmm. children have a special contribution to make. And I think we interact a lot with the environment, children do. We go down to the beach, we go to the park, and in our everyday lives. So when you look at that and you think that maybe one day I won't be able to go down to the beach, or maybe one day I won't be able to go to the park, then that sort of hits me, and I, I'm thinking that's not fair. Do you ever get mad at adults? Very bad. Sometimes we just get really, really angry. It's just, why don't they think of us? That's why we want to be there to act as a conscious conscience and reminder that look what you're doing. What you're doing now is what you are doing to our future. They're in a sense creating our future. 
These children from across the country are 10 to 15 years old and they won an essay contest about the environment. Now one of them will be chosen to go to Rio, but why children? Because we have something to say. Children are two-fifths of the world's population and it seems grossly unfair to me that two-fifths of the world's population should have no voice. So we feel that urgency, right? Because we know our future's at stake and that's the urgency that we have to bring to Earth Summit discussions. The kids' role model, Desiree McGraw. She is Canadian and one of only two youth ambassadors to UNSAID from around the world. And Rio is truly going to be, I hope, a turning point in history. McGraw wants the politicians in Rio to know that problems of alcohol and drug use and suicide in young people is because they don't believe they have a future. If governments are sitting there negotiating and they see young people who are listening and who are watching and who are speaking their minds, it does make it much more difficult for them to get away with doing nothing. How you doing, Big Am? How you doing? Hi. This group call themselves Wheels of Change, six young people who wanted to go to Rio and then decided there was another way. They'll spend their summer biking through BC trying to raise awareness about environment and development oh. issues. <laughs> we made it. Not again. Not on. I think it's pretty contradictory to go somewhere else and say, I can't believe you all are doing this when you turn around and look at our own country and see what's happening. Somebody come into the center and offer a shape. Again, everything is going to have to do with social issues. They're being trained here in interactive theatre techniques to get people thinking about what is wrong in their community. We're going to tell them about the Earth Summit and we're going to tell them what's happening and work in a context so that when their leaders come back that they can say, we demand change. In other times, Vietnam, for example, youth has been on the outside of adult decision-making, but they had influence. Now they are demanding admission, demanding their voices be heard. We do not have a credibility gap. We aren't politicians. We're not in this for the money. We're in this because we want a place, a planet that is hospitable for us and for our children to grow up in. We realize that this is it. There will not be another chance to save this planet. There is one theme they all echo. In this, the voice of youth must be heard and heeded. It is, after all, their world. For News Magazine, this is Eve Savory, Galliano Island, BC. So you've decided to wear a reusable mask, but how to do it safely? First, wash your hands. Soap and water in for at least 20 seconds. Then put on your mask, making sure it's the right side up, and make sure it's tight behind your ears to not leave any gaps. It should cover your nose and chin. Some masks have a nose fitting. If yours does, make sure to bend it so it fits even tighter. If you wear glasses, it's even more important that the mask fits securely over your nose. That will help prevent your glasses from fogging up, which can be very annoying. Here's some other tricks. Pull the mask up and use the weight of your glasses to block the air, but also make sure that the mask still covers your chin. You can also use soap and water. The soap leaves behind a film that acts as a fog barrier. And once you have your mask on, do not touch your face or the mask. When you're ready to take off your mask, first wash your hands again, then remove the mask from the back, trying to not touch the front of it. Then you want to wash your mask. If it's a cloth or reusable one, you can just throw it in the washing machine. Some say the warmer the temperature, the better, but it's actually the soap that's more important. It's soap that dismantles the virus and washes it down the drain, which is why steaming masks isn't as reliable. And this is just for cloth or reusable masks, not for the medical grade masks. Leave those to the health professionals who need them. Plus, those masks are one-time use, so if you try to disinfect them, you might actually damage them. And how often should you wash your mask? Ideally, after every use, which is after every outing. And once you're done, wash your hands one final time. <laughs> CBC Vancouver is so lucky to have two award-winning still image photographers on staff. Ben Nelms and Maggie McPherson have been capturing life in the city. And here are some of their best images from this past week. And that's all for our Vancouver for this week. I hope you'll be able to join me weekday afternoons on CBC Radio 1 for On the Coast. Goodbye for now and do stay safe.